Hi, y'all. Katie Parker, alcoholic. Give me two seconds to clear all this out. Well, I got good news for you. You're in for a treat. How do you like that, huh? (laughs) I am very comfortable behind a microphone. Uh, I was really considering hitting the fire alarm to get you all down here, but it seemed to get everybody seemed to get down here. So, congratulations! I appreciate that. Uh, I was speaking, figuring I was speaking to about twelve people, and it was like, God dang, they're up and at them. Phil runs, a, I mean, uh, uh, Scott runs a good show here. Um, I've had the gift of sobriety since October the twenty eighth of nineteen eighty four, and for that I am extremely grateful. I. Uh, uh, you'll, you'll be hearing my husband shortly here afterwards. He's doing four and five and. He has uh, five and a half months less than I do. (laughs) You know, people say, uh, time doesn't matter. Damn sure does. (laughs) Damn sure does. And, uh, you know, in our house, when he he struggles, I always tell him, honey, it will make more sense in about five and a half months. Just hang in there. (laughs) I will never stop saying that, by the way. I just want you to know. My home group is the primary purpose group in Austin, Texas. We study the big book uh, line by line. It's, a, it's an unbelievable uh, home group that I have. And, and I have to tell you guys, you know, we are, we are packing 225 people into a big book study once a week. Yeah, it's a Tuesday. The big book is coming back in Alcoholics Anonymous. And... Uh, I'll warn you ahead of time, I'm a little bit like taking a drink out of a fire hose. You're going to probably get a little bit more than you were expecting. And so I just, I t- I've warned you, just, I've warned you. Okay, so it's, it's in. Um, I'm from Texas. I think it's important that you realize Texas is not the south. It is west. The south is, it's early. You know, here comes my geography. The south is east of Texas. You got that? So Texas is Texas. It was so funny. I had so many people coming up to me going, yeah, we saw you in New Jersey. I went, God, you guys came all the way over here. And I forget that y'all are like crammed up in this northeast region. You know, you, you know it, what, in 15 minutes you're in another state. You know, in Texas, in 15 minutes, you're just in South Austin. You know, you didn't, get, you didn't go anywhere. And, uh, and I swear, I have gotten such major geographical issues. Uh, school was not my cup of tea. And uh, it was funny because Mark said, man, you guys got to go into Philly. And I said, well, what's so special about Philly? And he goes, oh, my God. He goes, Ben Franklin and, and, and the Masons. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Who cares? I mean, Ben Franklin did electricity, and the Masons probably built something, you know, and uh, I I am not kidding you guys, in school, I swear in the seventh grade, it was like, I don't know what they're talking about in there, I really don't care, still don't care, oh, I married into a family of educators, oh God, it's payback, you know, Their, their fun time is a museum. I am not the museum girl. I don't care about art. I don't really care about politics. And I don't care about history. Okay? So I'm really excited your town has something big in it. Don't care. Okay? Uh, Gail cares. Gail is cares. She, well, she cares so much she became a, a fifth grade history teacher. I was, when she said that, I'm so self-centered, I thought, who was my fifth grade teacher? I got no idea. Hell, I... I got no idea who my 6th grade, 7th grade, 8th grade, I got no idea. I mean, I was all about looking out the window or skipping school. You know, it was, it's so interesting. But, uh, okay, enough about that. Um, the, uh, and, and I'm sure Charlie will explain what a mason is. I think it's a bricklayer. But <laughs> is it the Minnicks, the Masons, the what, uh, whatever they are? Uh, I also thought the Nile ran through New York. So there you go. Um, <clears throat> I was actually born in Mount Lebanon. Can you believe that? I was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Yeah, my dad played for the Steelers one year. So we are, yeah, we, I know you'll like me now. <laughs> and uh, uh, my, my grandparents lived on 230 Woodhaven Drive all, uh, for as long as I can remember. You know, so we came up here quite a bit. We, were, we only lived in, in Pittsburgh for about 30 minutes and then moved to Buffalo, New York for five years. And then I got to Texas as quick as I could. But... Um, you know, I, I got to tell you guys, yesterday, it was not easy for all the speakers to get here. As a matter of fact, Clancy's like watching Santa Claus right now. You know what I mean? 
he, he's made it somewhere to Cleveland, I think. So, you know, remember on, on the night before Christmas where they say Santa's in? It's like Clancy's now in Idaho. He's, he's making his way through, you know. And uh, we ran into Tom Ivester last night, and he left at 6 a.m., and he got in last night at 11, and he looked at us, he said, hell, I could have walked and got here faster. <laughs> Unbelievable. And so Charlie and I got up at 3.30. We normally don't take that early of a flight. We both have, um, I'm retired, and Charlie has uh, got a job where as long as he's got his phone, he can work. And so we traditionally will come in the day before or something like that. And this time we decided we had to do this 6 a.m. flight. And I'm not kidding you, last night was like, you know, we were nodding out like we were on methadone for the speakers. You know what I mean? You're just like... And I love everybody else is doing it. You know, I'm looking around watching everybody and you go. And then when you pop to, you try to pretend like you. <coughs> yeah, it was nothing. Oh, God. And, and I tell you, you know, uh, uh, Kim was fa- fantastic. Fantastic job, Kim. Really did a good job. And uh, uh, Gail, oh, my God, I love Gail. I so would have partied with Gail. We'd, we'd have been walking around with both our zippers unzipped. You know what I mean? I mean, my kind of, that picture just makes me just want to roll a joint. And I, I know we're in AA, don't get me wrong, but you know, that just kind of looked like a joint situation to me. And uh, uh, so, so does uh, uh, Oregon for some reason, but that's a whole other story. And uh, uh, and then Gary, oh my God, I, you know, I, I have had the pl- privilege of speaking with Gary before, and he I would have clearly drank with. I'm telling you what, he is my kind of drinker, he's my kind of guy, he doesn't worry about politically correct, he tells it the way he sees it, and I love that in these rooms. You with me on that? I love that. There's a line uh, that I've heard before about disturb the comforted and comfort the disturbed. And it says in, uh, I think it's in working with others or something, it says if you've disturbed the man, good, good. See, we, we get very comfortable in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. So I've got a tremendous amount of experience being very comfortable in AA. If something disturbs you, we have steps to work to figure it out from an entirely different angle. Not to go to the like-minded people that you run with so that they'll say, Oh, that was ridiculous. No, it's disturbed. Take that to somebody to give it to you from a different perspective. I also was just having an out-of-body experience because I was so tired. And I meant to say to to Gary, you are so ballsy. You want to know what I said? I love your balls. (laughs) You cannot unring the bell after that. I swear to God, like time I thought, oh, I am so tired. I, I'm out. I'm out. Oh. Yeah, that's on tape for the rest of my life. Um, you know, this, this conference, it's, a, it's an honor to speak. It's an honor to speak at any conference. It's an honor to do anything in Alcoholics Anonymous. Sometimes I have to remind myself of that. But it's an honor to speak at this conference because I've got a tremendous amount of giants and heroes here. And I'm telling you, all this lineup, you've got Mildred, Clancy, Tom, everyone that's out here, uh, Chris, uh, uh, Gary, Gail. It, it's unbelievable. I, I feel sometimes like I have won America's Got Talent. It's like... I'm in that lineup. <laughs> I got friends and sponsees here. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's all good. And Lee the Taper, I'm just crazy about Lee the Taper. They're, they're wonderful. I've learned so much from the Tapers. Please, please, please support the Tapers. I'm a big fan of them. We need that history, yes? And uh, now, did, did, my boys, did my boys from the halfway house come, Mike and Kenny? Oh, you better stand up. Somebody better stand up for them. <laughs> Those boys told me they'd be here, big fat liars. So you guys send a message back that I'm on it. Okay, my job is to talk about the third step, guys, and I'm so excited about this. I, uh, You know, in uh, being sober 28 years, I've got a tremendous amount of experience. Right? That's what, what time in Alcoholics Anonymous will give you is a tremendous amount of experience. I've got very good experience and I've got very bad experience. Now, bad experience isn't a bad thing. 
As a matter of fact, the second half of the third step prayer says, take away my difficulties so that victory over them can bear witness to you. Right? So the difficulties that I've had, I get to share with you in hopes that I can can get you to see it from a different perspective. And one of the things that I love is that uh, when, when when I share what I did wrong, I am not politically correct. I will not stand here and say that Alcoholics Anonymous is fine. I will not stand here. I love the fact that there are problems. Of course there are problems. They are important for us to look at things. If we see things that are not wrong, we should certainly check them out with somebody before we decide to barrel drive over there. I love what Gary was said is, you know, he said a lot of things, but that doesn't mean I get to go into the next middle of the road AA meeting, raise my hand and go, this guy doesn't know what the hell he's talking about okay I just heard Gary from Colorado you know what I mean because that you you got to grow an understanding and effectiveness the ego can't handle it and when you're not effective you're not effective and that's myself too I tend to say a lot of you's I mean I I won't correct that okay so when I'm saying you include me got it okay so Oh, gosh, I, I'll never forget one place I was in. This chick came up to me as, as for some reason. If you, if you don't like something I said, please go tell your sponsor. <laughs> Not me. Sponsor. And uh, so, uh, you know, the, this chick comes up and she goes, you speak a lot of yous. You don't claim the I. Well, I just wanted to punch her. You know, at that point, I, <laughs> I thought, really? Is that all you got out of this deal? Oh, geez, Louise. Okay, so, didn't mean to get off on that tangent, but it just felt right. Uh, what I did is, is, is uh, I worked a program. When I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, there was not, it, it, in my particular circumstance, this wasn't happening all over the country, but in my particular circumstance, there wasn't anybody really qualifying us. It was assumed, if you're in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, nobody gets here by mistake. Yes, they do. Okay, never even occurred to me. Never occurred to me till I was 17 years sober that people do get here by mistake, and it is our responsibility to qualify. And these steps all work together; they dovetail together. I'm, my job is the third step, and so I was—I uh, worked a program based on the abstinence of alcohol. You get the alcohol out of my life, and I am fine from here. You see, because when I drank, alcohol did something for me that nothing else did. Now I didn't know that when I took that drink. I didn't go, "Oh my God." This just fixed my problems. I took the drink and my problems were fixed. See, it wasn't like all of a sudden I knew I had this dark hole. I was an outgoing kid, man. That's how self manifests for me. I'm an outgoing kid. I'm loud. I'm obnoxious. I'm the one over here trying to get the attention. I'm third born, right? It's like, hey, 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 I'm getting screwed. Somebody's leaving without me. You know, and that's what I did all my life. You know, that's how I show up. So self-manifested in various ways is what causes our failure. That's the beauty of the third step. The third step is to show you the many different ways that self shows up. So if you show up and you're quiet, you never say a peep, you're like smoke in a room, you're not any less alcoholic than I am because of my personality. It's just the different ways that self shows up. So that's what we're going to cover here. But when I took that drink, and by the time I found my way into Alcoholics Anonymous at 26 years old, I I swear to God, I'd have told you the drink was my problem. It absolutely was, because it used to work, and it doesn't work anymore. I had no idea that selfishness and self-centeredness was the root of my problem. As a matter of fact, the way I read the book was that selfishness and self-centeredness was the root of my problem when I drank. But when you take the booze off of me, man, I am, everybody loves Katie. I was, I'm going to give you some insight, voted most likable in high school four years in a row. (laughs) Do you have any idea how much work that is to talk to the nerds that you cannot stand merely for the vote, just for the vote? I was on the swim team just for the vote, okay? The nerds are on the swim team. Are you with me on that? In the back of the bus, it's like, oh, I got to make out with him. Oh, fine. Most likable's on the line. And, uh, oh, my God. And so, so what I ended up doing was, uh, because, see, I'll do anything i got to do to get what I want. So will you. You do realize that. No matter how long you're sober, 
The book never says that goes away. We'll be less and less interested, more and more interested in this, less and less of that. We rest on our laurels. So I, I believe that AA was for the drink problem. Counseling was for living because it was codependency recovery therapy, right? That's what we were doing in the 80s. And so codependency recovery therapy, I did group therapy for 10 years. <laughs> I'm well qualified to do a pseudo group right here with you boys. <laughs> I'll facilitate it. Come on, get down to those innermost fears you got. And uh, the church was, uh, uh, you know, for seeking God. And what I, what I didn't know, guys, is that what I was doing was I was in, in the codependency recovery therapy. I'm not saying this stuff is bad. As a matter of fact, I took it to the extreme. I took it way too far. Wait, 10 years? Come on. I was in there with all my AA buddies. That's what we were doing. I learned, I, I learned more about them I should never have known. Way too much. It's like just an in-depth fifth step. You know what I mean? And uh, one of the things I learned from that is I didn't realize this, but when I talk about becoming the victim of the delusion that I can rest satisfaction and happiness if I just manage well, what ended up happening was I learned so much about Katie's inner workings that I would just detach from you. You know what, you're, you're a problem, and you're not good for me, and so I'm going to just detach, and I set boundaries. And see, what I realized today is what I was doing is I was separating myself from anybody that disturbed me, all justifiably. And I think that that is a big piece of what ends up happening when we talk about this victim of the delusion. See, you got a, somebody at work you don't like, you quit. You separate yourself and go, wow, thank God that's over. You're in a relationship that doesn't work, you get out of it. Thank God that's over. You're in a, you have a roommate situation that you don't like, you leave. See, we just separate. We believe we've solved the problem. And what the problem is, is now I'm not saying it's not for you to leave or not leave, but you do the spiritual work so that you're not leaving under the wrong terms. See, it's all about having compassion for your fellow. On my own power, I can't do that. Oh, my God, on my own power, I can't even walk into the grocery store without judging everybody. <laughs> everybody. I don't know what it is about grocery stores and me, man. I get in there with the cart, and I become the sheriff of the grocery store. <laughs> I don't like the grocery shop anyway, and you've been hanging out at those tomatoes too long. <laughs> get your tomatoes and get out of here. You know, there's no standing on the diving board. And, uh, and I'm telling you what, you, you, you end up looking at this stuff, and, and I mean, I'll walk through and I'll walk past a woman and I'll think, oh, Jesus, honey, conditioner, something. Uh. Mm. Now, I won't say it. Matter of fact, I'll walk by and go, hi. But the rattle in this head can be disturbing. And, uh, and, and that's, that's me. That's me. That's what the, I think that's you too. But for some reason, if we got time, the disease, the allure of the disease, the seductiveness of time. Oh, excuse me, illness. I'm going back to that. I, I told Gary, I said, you have given me a perspective on the word disease and illness. And I use the word disease a lot. And I respect that I'm going to work on illness because I do like that. I like that. I like everything. But I liked that very much. So forgive me. Uh, we'll be working on that. Um, but this, this illness, now where was I? Uh, thank you. Yeah, I'm back in that grocery store, aren't I? Um, oh, my children won't even go with me. You know what I mean? Because I just, I just mutter and mumble and whatever. But, um, but the, the, the uh, seductiveness of long-term sobriety is that I'm not going to have those thoughts. Show me that in the literature. Shut up. <laughs> Shut up. It says that we're going to get rid of this. Well, not like taking the garbage out and you get rid of it and never see it. Rid of it means to be set free. As long as I stay in fit spiritual condition. Well, I was in the fitness business for 30 years. And, uh, yeah, it paid, it paid nice dividends. That and the four years of most likable have done very well. Uh, but... The, the thing about it is, is, is um, one of the things in the fitness business is that you have to eat good and exercise uh, every day. Every day. Now, if you find that difficult to do, you should. It's a discipline. It's a very difficult discipline, right? I'm disciplined in that area because it was my career. Spiritually is a discipline. 
So I ask people when they're not doing very well, I ask them, when was the last time you did a 10th step? With your sponsor. We have a tendency to go to like-minded people. With your sponsor. When did you do a verbal or written 10th step? Did you do a verbal or written 11th step evening review? Did you take that into prayer and meditation? Do you sponsor? Where are you on the amends process? If you're weak in that area, your disciplines are weak and you're not going to be in this state of mind. It's our barometer. I'm huge on a barometer. My internal barometer's got to tell me where I'm going. It's the one that says, if I'm in the grocery store and I got way too many of those voices chattering, I'm a little restless, irritable, and discontented. I'll be talking to my sponsor. We need to probably look at something here. What's going on? Hell, I sponsor half the country, so I know I'm doing, I'm working with others, trust me. And it works when everything else fails. There's no doubt about that. But I love that whole counseling thing. So I learned so much about self. And self cannot fix self. It thinks it can. And this is the way it starts to work. It sounds like this. Katie, you know better than that. Don't, no, just don't say anything. (laughs) Right? Did you hear any God in that? Oh, no. And then I think to myself, good. You didn't say anything. You did good. You did good. Because I got to tell myself I did good. Yeah, you got it. Oh, yeah. We've got such low self-esteem. We must, you know, I had sticky notes everywhere. I love myself. I love myself. You're beautiful. And, uh, and so, oh, my God. And, and don't get me wrong, some of that stuff works right up until it doesn't work. That's just the way it works. And so what i got to do is when all of a sudden somebody disturbs me, which happens frequently, I have to say to myself, you know what, God, help me see this person as a sick person like myself. Please keep me from being angry. Help me show them the same patience, tolerance, and pity I'd grant a sick friend, right? These are the things I must do. That's a whole different prayer than, come on, Katie, don't say anything. You know, so just, I'm just saying. And so uh, one of the things about this counseling is it, it, um, it, it flew in the face of page 19 and 20. And I love this. I hope this page is, is darkened and earmarked in your book. Bottom of page 19, top three lines up. It says, most of us sense the real tolerance of other people's shortcomings and viewpoints or respect for their own opinions or attitudes which make us more useful to others. Our very lives as ex-problem drinkers depends upon our constant thought of others and how we may meet their needs. Well, here's the tricky part about that, guys. That, that's a lot of words, but what it basically says is another poor person's shortcomings, the things that bug me the most about you, are my guiding light. Wrap your brain around that one. See, the things that bug me most about you just bug me about you. That's about as far as I go. See, and and how many of you guys have sat in an AA meeting and then here comes big head dud. Then there's bandana Brian. That's my barometer, man. That's my barometer. Tenth step tells me I got to take that stuff to God. Got to take it to another human being. Might need to write on it. And that's the tricky thing. It starts off in the third step where it says being convinced. Being convinced of what? The A, Bs, and Cs. Steps one and two. And it says which we decide to turn our will and our lives over the care of God as we understood him. Right? I love this next line. Just what do we mean by that and what do we do? What a fair question. I don't know about you, but I didn't understand it. I still don't quite understand the depth of self-centeredness that I live in. I mean to tell you, my sponsor lives in 60 to 63, lives in it. When I call her and I am really disturbed, she's like, Katie, did you write about it? It takes me about 15 minutes to do an inventory. 15 minutes. I'm just writing on one person. And that one person traditionally is either a member of Alcoholics Anonymous or my husband. I mean, come on. You know what I mean? I mean, it doesn't say resentment's the number one offender. It kills more alcoholics than anything else. Or, it, excuse me, it destroys more alcoholics because somebody had to correct me on that. They probably didn't correct you on anything, Gary, but they correct me on everything. And, uh, and you know, they said, uh, uh, but it doesn't say unless it's your husband. Oh, my God. You know, we, we are incapable of forming a true partnership with another human being, and I'm not going to write inventory on Charlie about once a month. Before you know it, I've married the wrong man. I mean, I don't like the way he sips his coffee, the breathing in and out and in and out. Mm. Mm. 
And then before you know it, he reaches over and touches you and you go. That's the man I'm going to grow old with, the one I love, down deep to my core. See, I must write inventory. I must write inventory. So it says, just what do we, so it spends the next two pages explaining what we mean, and then it switches to what we do. My experience was, is, is I come into Alcoholics Anonymous, they, they think, you know, they say, they, they, the best qualifications is, are you alcoholic? Yes, I am. Okay, great. Well, you got a problem with God? No, I got, okay, good. Well, let's get on your knees and do the third step prayer. And, you know, I, once again, I hate to say there was anything wrong with that because it absolutely was effective for me. I'm not to here to blame anybody. Matter of fact, blame is not what it's about. It's about to share my experience with you so you can lay your experience up against it. And we go down, we do the third step prayer, and the selfishness and self-centeredness never touched me. Never touched me. We did that third step prayer. I found it to be quite hokey. It had the word bondage in it. What the hell? I'm brand new sober, okay? I, I was an active little girl, you know. It's like, whatever, whatever. And, uh, you know, this is the way the newcomer thinks. And so, um, and so then it switches over on the, uh, you know, the next page to just what we do. And it's, it says, it turns out that there's requirements. It says the first requirement is that we be convinced that any life run on self-will can hardly be a success. Hmm. That's a requirement. Well, what's a requirement in life? If you go get a job somewhere and they say we need you to open up the building at 8.30 and answer the phones at 8.45, well, if you show up at 9, you haven't even met the first requirement. See, the minute we play God, we're not meeting the requirement. We're not even agreeing with it. But at this point, I believe the book doesn't expect you to because it says that we have to be convinced. And then it says on page 64, being convinced that self manifested in various ways is what had defeated us, we consider its common manifestations. Well, by page 64, it's telling me that they explain to us how self shows up differently for everybody. Kind of cool, isn't it? Pretty powerful pages. So it says, um, that one of the things we joke a lot about in AA is, you know, I, we, you know, people say, you know, well, I leave God out of my finances and my romances and, and all of this stuff. And the truth of the matter is, is all I would bring God in for was when I had trouble. There was, there was no other. Meditating when you're brand new sober, I thought was sitting in the lotus position. Well, forget it. I still can't do anything of that nature. That's not my cup of tea. But I had no communication with God whatsoever. And, and that doesn't mean I wasn't working the steps. I did the semantics of everything. My life got better because our life gets better. One of the, one of the things in AA is most of us, the gifts take us away. All of a sudden I get married. All of a sudden I have another baby. All of a sudden my career takes off and I just don't have time. I've been doing this deal for three years. Let the new guy, don't you love that at three years? Let the new guy do it. Because <laughs> I got it. And the longer we're sober, it's harder and harder to get through to that ego. Because I got so much knowledge. Uh, Mark Houston was a huge, uh, a huge fan of Mark Houston's. Love him to death. And he was my husband's sponsor. And and I, uh, hello, Tom. Yeah, I'll start over. Go ahead. Come on in. Yeah. Tom's here. He all but walked. Come sit, Tom, come sit up at this table. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I ratted you out. Yes, I did. Uh, but it gives me an opportunity to start over. So, from the beginning. <laughs> um. But my life was all about God take a knee. It was all about, you know, I'll give this to God, but I don't know about you guys, but God works way too slow. Don't you agree? Oh, my God. You do the whole, you, your sponsor says, you know, do nothing. What? <laughs> Position of neutrality. You want me to do nothing? See, I'm a doer. I get stuff done. And uh, for me to do nothing is so that God can work the deal out. Well, that takes about 20 seconds. And I go, you know, give me back that baton. I'm back running the show until I'm in constant collision. And then I give it back to God and then I take it back and I give it back. And, and that's, that's the deal. And don't get me wrong, at 28 years sober, I still do the same thing from time to time. Well, the difference between me today and then is that what used to last three weeks lasts about 30 minutes max. Maybe even as quick as three. See, it doesn't, it doesn't last that long. I'm not in the bondage of self for that kind of time. And it says, 
it says, um, on that basis, which is an underlying foundation, we're almost always in collision with something or somebody, even though our motives are good. Huh? See, that's the tricky line right there. Because what happens, I believe, is I come into Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm a, I'm a jerk. You know, I'm a, I'm a con artist. I, I will get and do whatever I have to to get what I want, right? I don't think too much of myself or too little of myself. All I think about is me. And so one of the things about this process is, when, it, when it's talking about this basis, is I know that it's not okay for me to jump your butt. I know I don't get to get in an argument with you. I know I need to behave. I know I'm not supposed to steal anymore. And I have all these real simple, fundamental, basic principles, right? So then what do I do? I become so nice and helpful. I'll hold the door for you. You really need to say thank you, but, you know... I'll let you in in traffic, but you better do. Yeah. And if you sneeze, bless you, bless you, bless you. And uh, I've never seen anything like it in the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. One person sneezed, the entire group says, bless you. Stop it, okay? Stop it. Guy sneezed on the airplane last week we were flying somewhere. Not one person said, bless you. Because they don't need to. They don't need to impress anybody. Bless you. Hey, you, you, need a, you need me? You need me to help you? No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look how good I am. I'm so good. Now, don't get me wrong. There's not, this is not bad etiquette. Oh, my God, I'm in the airport. Charlie and I are fighting bad yesterday. Wow, bad. And we're walking along in the airport as if we don't even know each other. 20 feet ahead of me. Fine. I don't care. And this guy comes walking. He's clearly an athlete, right? And he's a big guy, you know, just that chiseled look. And he's got these uh, shorts drooping, and you can see about that much of his underwear. Uh, stop it. Okay, that, I don't want to see your underwear. I don't want to see a girl's underwear. I don't want to see a boy's underwear. He goes, but this much of his underwear. And by the time he's getting close to me, now it's got nothing to do with me. He literally lifts his shirt up and sticks his hand down his pants. And I looked at him, and I went, Really? Really? <laughs> Oh, my, your mother would be disgusted at that move. And I mean, the guy is just, oh, my God. Nobody else was saying anything to him. Nobody. See, I am the sheriff of etiquette. And, oh, it gets worse. Just Follow one of us around. One of the things I love to do is I tell people, when the book talks about being this extreme example of self-will run riot, comma, though we usually don't think so. <laughs> that's drunk or sober. That's today. That's today. And so what I tell you is, in life, I want you to watch this reaction from people. Not so much in AA. We'll just endure your drown, droning on and on. And then we'll walk away and talk crap about you. You know what I mean? Oh, my God. Oh, Jesus. Oh, blah, 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 blah. But in the work world, I want you to, to look for this. That's all it takes. That's an extreme example. You can ask an alcoholic if they're married and 15 minutes later, you might get an answer. That, that is a yes or no question. Period. Okay. <clears throat> uh, and, and, and so, um, it talks about the actor running the whole show. You know, and a kid and I last night were talking about uh, being the sheriff. And it was so funny because he said, my sponsor tells me I'm the sheriff. And I thought, dude, I'm the sheriff. Hey, you got no idea what you're up against. You merely are the deputy when you're in my... I am the sheriff of everything in my mind. Everything. Cell phone use drives me crazy. If you've got your cell phone on, turn it off. There's nothing that can be happening in this hour that you can't miss on Facebook or Twitter or whatever you're doing. Because what... Yes... And in an AA meeting, 
do not read your book on your phone. It's deceiving to the new guy. Bring your book. And, what, and the other thing that makes me crazy about that is, is that you can't live past a tweet or a bling or a toilet. And, and what you don't understand is, is that at that moment, somebody might be saying exactly what you need to hear because God set this thing in motion. And you just took a tweet. And I swear to God, the minute you get bored, you better be paying attention to what the ego's doing. Benjamin Franklin just came in the room. I just want to... It's like an omen. Uh, oh, my God. I know he did electricity, okay? Charlie and I were wherever Paul Revere rode in on that horse one time, and, and Charlie's like... Katie, look, it's Paul Revere's statue, you know, and I'm thinking, <laughs> you know, and, and so there's that, and then there's a Starbucks. I'm going to the Starbucks. <laughs> and our little host was going, I can't do this, I have to stay with him. I go, no, you don't, remember, I'm the sheriff. Come. <laughs> I will use all the power I got, man. And so it says, uh, it says we're the actor running the whole show. You know, and, and here's the deal about the actor, guys. We are merely in the show of life. We don't run the show. What? How many of you guys are employees? Raise your hand if you're an employee. See, look at that. I swear half of us are not. What are you? Self-employed. You're either self-employed or unemployed, right? And I, I was self-employed for 30 years because, see, I can't have anybody telling me anything. And so, if you're employed, how many times a week do you feel you could run that company better than the people who run that company? <laughs> yeah. My God, a bunch of idiots run this place. <laughs> now, granted, you got no, no stresses. You don't own the, the payroll. You have no idea what's going on, but by God, put me in charge. And... <clears throat> it's, 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 and, and we are really the sheriff of our AA meeting. Oh my God, I love when Gary said that he found no reason why they needed to change the name. There's so much power in that statement. You see, we must be awakened, our spirit must be awakened before we can change. So if you get disturbed, it's because we're waking you up. God is waking us up. I'm constantly watching for me being disturbed. Resentment, dishonesty, selfishness, and fear. Have any of those ever felt good? God, I'm pissed. I love it. And that scares the crap out of me. Yippee-yay-okay-yay. You know, what we do is we try to fix it. And if we don't do what is required, the clear-cut directions out of the book... We're just victims of our own delusion and we're managing it. And so what, and, and trust me, it, it's the nature of this illness. <laughs> and, uh, uh-huh, yeah. Now I'll tell you what, I've had a hundred people come and correct my quotation. And, uh, but I gotta tell you, I love the way Gary said it and I listened. Because if you come at me the wrong way, I'll have to kill you. See? So, um, but one of the things about this, guys, is, is that we, when we ask to be awakened, this spiritual awakening, none of us like the leveling of our pride, the, the self-searching that's required for this deal. Of course you're not going to like it. You're not, when I call my sponsor, I, I, I delusionally think at one point she's going to say, Charlie should never have said that. <laughs> he is so off the mark, Katie. <laughs> never. 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 Thank God. So when I call my sponsor, she's going to tell me what I really today want to hear. But it's swallowing and digesting large chunks of truth about myself. Yes? And so, okay, i got to keep moving because I'm sure Lee's going to show me that little five-minute, two-minute, and one-minute deal. I'll go over one place and I get in trouble. Um, so, you know, i got to tell you guys, this level of self-centeredness, this actor running the whole show, when, when we speak, you get this, this, it's a fabulous privilege and everything, but after you do enough of these deals, they, they have a tendency, they set you on the front row, and the front row means a, a lot of things. A, you got a seat reserved, you got one of the best seats in the house, but you also have access to being the first five people in the receiving line. 
very important. And uh, so you don't have to wait in that long receiving line. And so what we're in, in a place where there's 1,500 people, you know, there. And, and uh, the speaker was speaking, and, and we beeline it up to her. And sometimes at those events, they, they get two receiving lines start going, right? And uh, that's a problem. And uh, so these two receiving lines go, well, there's a guy standing in front of me, and I'm in the shorter one. And so, you know, the, the speaker is hugging and talking and hugging and talking, and she keeps turning to this guy, and he doesn't do anything. And I'm like, what the heck? You know, you, you missed your shot twice, buddy. And so the next time she turns, I just shove him. <laughs> but get, get it moving, dude. You know, and I swear he does this. He goes... Come to find out in the countdown, he had three days sober. Okay, so I love what it says here. It says, if only my arrangements would stay put. If only people would do as I wished. Move it, buddy. Come on. You know? Everybody, including myself, would be great, would be happy. The show would be great. It would be Katie Topia. <laughs> you know? And, and so what that would require is in the morning, everybody gets the script. In my home, did you pick up the script? At work, did you pick up the script? At my AA meeting, did you all pick up the script? Okay, and action. Every, do, and then here's the best part. I can change my mind at any time. So you better be, you know, wah, ha, 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 ha. Oh, my God. So here's the tricky part behind this kind motive thing, okay? Because I am absolutely blinded to my motive. Blinded to it, especially behind a kind one. All I was trying to do was be helpful. Everybody's pissed. <laughs> Tried to do something nice for my home group. Everybody's pissed. I was at work and registration at a conference, right? That was my, my task. But we hadn't got the conference, hadn't come up yet, and I saw a speaker, and I thought that speaker would be perfect for our conference. So you ask him, can you speak at our conference? Sure, what's the date? So I come back to the committee. I said, I found a speaker. You didn't go through the right process. So everybody's mad at me. I was just trying to be helpful. I was just trying to run the show. See, and that's how that works. I actually didn't do that. That just happened a little while back. But, um, and so, so here's the funnel, and I love this funnel. So I take my kind motive, right, even though I'm in constant collision with somebody or something, even though my motive is good, and I take the delusion, if everyone would do as I wished, and I run my actions through there, and I'm only going to get about an A- minus if I screw up. See? And if everything goes my way, it was God's will. <laughs> Don't you love that? I love, this is, like I said, I sponsor half the country. Mildred sponsors the other half. And, uh, and I, I said, um, uh, somebody will say they met somebody, God's will. Oh, yeah, well, let's wait to about 30 days. And you'll be hating their guts. Or you get a job. That is God's will. And within, you know, six months, you hate everybody you work with. Very simple to have happen. Now, you can do the work behind that. And I'm not saying if it is or isn't God's will, don't get me wrong. My job is merely the vessel. I am the vessel to get you connected to the power. You do not want me managing your life. You do not want me telling you what job to take, what boy to date, what car to buy. My job is to merely give you all of the what I see. All of what I see about you. And I think I do a good job. Um, <laughs> let's see, where am I? Okay, so when I screw up, I am always going to just be telling you about my motives. See, it's mercy for me, justice for them. You screw up, it's an outrage, for God's sake. What was that guy thinking? He is stupid. But if I screw up, I'm going to explain why. You know, I'll tell you something. My husband passed away. I was married 20 years, and Charlie and I have an amazing best friend relationship. He was at my wedding. And long story, I'm throwing this one in because I may go over. And, uh, but uh, my sister 
called me when my husband died. He died of a heroin overdose at 23 years sober. We were sitting in untreated alcoholism and didn't know it. So this hits very close to home. I was married 20 years. And um, my sister calls and says, listen, we have a long talk. My sister and I are tight. We're, we're just 18 months apart. I'm crazy about my sister. And, and she's crazy, but other than that. And uh, <clears throat> she says, you know, Katie, if you could have the funeral on Sunday, it would be easier for me. The acorn does not fall far from the tree, right? (laughs) My stepmother, unfortunately, just passed away last month. And I heard myself say to my stepsister, I don't know when you're planning on having the funeral, but if you could do it next weekend, it would work better for my schedule. Can you believe that? My sister devastated me with that statement. And when I heard it, I couldn't stop it. And it was like, wow. Wow. Thank God I'm awake. Thank God I'm awake to see that. Because now I've got to do the work behind that. See, instead of calling my sponsor going, Oh my God, I can't believe I did that. Why? Are you shocked at how self-centered you are? (laughs) That's self-centered. As a matter of fact, if a sponsee starts a conversation with, I can't believe I'm getting ready to tell you what I'm going to tell you, then stop it. (laughs) Page 133, one of my favorite pages in the book, says the deliberate manufacture of misery, we did it. God didn't do it. Cheerfully, cheerfully capitalize on it so he can show his omnipotence. What would happen if after I did that, I got off the phone and thanked God from the bottom of my heart that I know him better? Thank you, God, for getting me to see that about myself. Wow, that's not who I want to be. Help me be more loving, more kind, more understanding. Help me see how I can make that right to my stepsister, which of course I did. But you see what I'm saying? I did exactly what my sister did to me. And when she did it, it was an outrage. But when I did it, I took that kind motive, that delusion, my schedule. Oh, it was terrible. What I saw, you know what I mean, what I saw in that. Swallowing and digesting large chunks of truth about herself is like swallowing glass. You know what I mean? I swear my sponsor and I were doing inventory, and she's got this head bobbing thing that she does. And and I mean, I'm over there, it's like stuck right here, and she's doing this. And I said, you know, could you stop that? For just one minute, I said, man, I am swallowing and digesting in that head bobbing things. I'm going to have to slap you. You know what I mean? Um, and then, then the book goes on. See, see, this level of self-centeredness is in my DNA. Alcohol was the solution. Don't get me wrong. It's a serious problem. Serious. But it solves the pain. Right? That's what it does. It's an elixir that solves the pain of living a life based on this level of self-centeredness. And so it says, so it's in my DNA. So it says, in trying to make these arrangements, our actor may be sometimes quite virtuous. This is the toolkit of self-will. He may be kind, considerate, patient, generous, even modest and self-sacrificing. On the other hand, he may be mean, egotistical, selfish, and dishonest. He is more likely to have varied traits. Absolutely. And I love this, guys. People say alcoholics are controlling and manipulative. Oh, I just want to slap you when you say that. I feel like I'm back in that group therapy session. Manipulative and controlling? Yeah? I mean, oh my God, we are self-seekers. That is a part of this illness. We self-seek and don't even know we're doing it. Self-seeking is an action. And so I'm a self-seeker, and I love this one. It says people say they're people pleasers. Oh, really? Show me all the people you've pleased. Can you? Yeah. And so, you know, we are, we are attention suckers is what we are. <laughs> Approval suckers. And that's a self-seeker even when trying to be kind. I'm such a people pleaser, really. Well, you're bugging me, so, okay. <laughs> Right, right now, you're not pleasing me, okay? And so, and, and that's why controlling and manipulative is not in our book. Oh, my God, the root of our illness is selfishness and self-centeredness. 
We are driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity. Okay. So, now, it says, um, the other thing, too, that I love is page 61 is a paragraph that I literally go to every time my sponsee calls. Because why does a sponsee call me? Please do not call me to check in. I am not your check, I'm not your life coach. I'm not your check in girl. As a matter of fact, when you call me to check in, I'm gonna dig so deep and I am gonna slap you and you're not gonna even know what hit you. You know what I mean? Because the book tells me that I am to watch for. Charlie and I are competitive shotgun shooters. <laughs> Do you love that? I swear there is nothing like, a woman should have a shotgun and a power washer. Okay? <laughs> Give me those two things and you never need therapy again. So, when, when you're watching for these, we, we do sporting clays, you know. And so when you, when you do sporting clays, you're watching for this bird. There's a look point. You're constantly on point to pay attention. That's what the book requires me to do throughout my day. So you call me and tell me that you're just checking in. You're not watching. You're, as a matter of fact, you're grading your own paper. So I don't call my sponsor and say, I'm just checking in. i got no time for that. I have all I want is for you to call me with your 10th step or tell me where you are on the continued amends, you know, whatever, a question with a sponsee, that's my job. Not, not, I'm not here to be your best friend. Matter of fact, I won't be your best friend. I don't like that. I lose perspective when I'm your best friend. All of a sudden, I don't like the guy you're dating when I get too close to you. See, that's not good. So it says on page 61, and I got tons of AA girlfriends, Right? So don't get me wrong. So it says on page 61, it says, what usually happens? See, I get this phone call. They call me. What usually happens? The show didn't come off very well. She begins to think life doesn't treat her right. (laughs) Self-pity. She decides to exert herself more, driven by fear. Right? She becomes on the next occasion still more demanding or gracious. The toolkit of self-will. How can I get my way? I know what I'll do. I'll say this to her. I'll be nice to her. I'll be mean to him. <laughs> I am completely asleep. Spirit is asleep. And it says, as the case may be, still the play doesn't suit her. How many of you guys have tried to call back your significant other to, to make an amends and it got worse? <laughs> Don't you love that one? As a matter of fact, it was worse than the beginning. Fight. It says, still the play doesn't suit her. Admitting she may be somewhat at fault. She is sure others are more to blame. Oh, my God. You know the term that makes me crazy in AA is my part. My part is not in the book anywhere. It is all my part. 110% responsibility. My troubles are of my own making. They arise out of myself, and the alcoholic is an extreme example of self-will run riot, though she usually doesn't think so. Right? The other delusion. It says uh, she becomes angry, indignant, and self-pity. Angry, I cannot believe that happened. Indignant for all I've done for them behind a kind motive, right? Self-pity. I'm just surrounded by idiots. (laughs) I can't work with these people. So what's the basic trouble, that underlying foundation, right? Is Katie really not a self-seeker? even when trying to be kind. Is she not a victim, which means tricked or duped, of the delusion that she can rest satisfaction, rest means to seize by force the sheriff, and happiness out of this world if she only manages well. We're out there managing our butt off, man. And if things go great, it's good. I got my way. And if things don't, I had a sponsee call me and she had a situation where this particular individual left. And she goes, my problems are over. And I said, oh, no, see. And it was God's will that that person left. <laughs> don't you love that? And I said, oh, no, 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 don't, don't see that that way. Matter of fact, the work is still yours. We don't get to stop on this work. And, and that's what it is. See, I'm blinded to self and I, I, I am blinded to seeing self-centeredness in Katie. Sometimes I do, don't get me wrong. But not behind kind motives. Oh, my God. But I can see self-centeredness in you so well. Oh, my God, Charlie. Jesus. Uh. He's got to have it worse than me. He, ha- he has got to have it worse than me. And 
I, but that's what I mean. I see it in him. And this is what I do today when I see this level of self-centeredness in others. My very first question is, God, show me how I do that. Please don't let me go down to that spot where I go, can you believe that? Please let me see that self-centeredness and take that moment where my thought life is placed on a higher plane, where I am in a position of neutrality, where I can match calamity with serenity, where I can intuitively know how to handle situations that used to baffle me. Please have me stop and go, how do I do that? See, that's why if you don't sponsor, oh, please, please, you're missing the greatest gift, and that is the mirror image of yourself. You've got to see it in others, and then you can see it in yourself. That just gave me goosebumps. I've never said it quite like that before. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. Yeah, and th- some people say that you shouldn't take notes. God doesn't move through you. Shut up. That was a moving moment. Okay, so it says, and then it says, because I like notes. I, I love the podium. I like notes. I love to do the whole deal, man. And so it says, now the line I love, it says, isn't it evident to all the rest of the players that these are the things she wants and don't her actions make each of them wish to snatch and retaliate everything they can out of the show? <laughs> How many of you guys have ever been at doing something for a home group and somebody else is doing it and you see their self-centeredness and you're trying to snatch everything you can out of it? Or how about with your sponsor? How many of you guys get competitive with your sponsor? Oh, she likes Mary better than me. Yeah, it's always about Mary, 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 Mary. That kind of stuff. That's what that line's talking about. And I just want Mary to drink. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Stop it. Don't act like I'm just terrible. You have those same thoughts. I guarantee at some point everyone in this room has thought, I hope they drink. <laughs> now, I'm not, I may not tell anybody, but it's, it's, it's you know, and I'm not, I'm not responsible for that first thought. But I better take action on it because that's pretty ugly. Matter of fact, I wrote inventory on that particular individual that I thought about in that meeting when I did that. I called my sponsor and I said, wow, Marty, I just had this feeling that this person, you know, I wish they'd drink. She said, write some inventory, man. You got, a, you got a deep hate for that person. See, I don't get to think that and just ignore it. I begin to get blocked from this sunlight of the spirit, right? And so it says, listen to these self-will traps. <clears throat> I think I know what the package should look like. So see, if I ask God that I want this certain type of job, I think I know what that job looks like. And I think I know if I want this certain sponsee, that this sponsee should look a certain way and do certain things. See, I have this delusion what the package should look like. When I really am walking in this spiritual path day by day, it requires that. Remember the disciplines. When I am in that path, I'm open for the package to look any way it's going to look. That's a tough one. Um, If there's only one acceptable answer, if you have you ever asked somebody a question and they better answer it right, or we got trouble, then we don't get to ask the question. This one's one of my favorite ones. You know, it's 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 rampant. It's big. It's 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 clearly you know off the topic, but it's got a little bit to do with relationship. Is is the pornography? You know, if you're going to ask your boy if he's doing porn, you better be prepared for the answer. Because if you're not, if he says no, you believe he's lying. And if he says yes, you're going to have to kill him. There was no acceptable answer there. And you, you paint yourself in the corner. See, position of neutrality, we really don't get to ask that question. We do a lot of prayer and a lot of stuff behind that. It says, um, uh, uh, oh my God, story stealing. Holy smokes. Be aware of this one. I could point out four people I know that are major story stealers in here. And... Uh, <laughs> I have to avoid them like the plague. You know what I mean? I'm like, well, hmm. This is what a story stealer looks like. All of a sudden, we're, we're at this event, and it, it was, there was some non-AAs there, right? There, I think they were in Al-Anon. And, and this woman is a singer-songwriter. And we, in the events at her house, she's putting a big deal on, and she's a singer-songwriter. Now, I'm, I'm as self-centered as these story stealers. Don't get me wrong. I'm just heightenedly aware of story stealing. And so, uh, so we say, there's about six of us standing around, and, and I said, so you're a singer-songwriter? And she goes, yeah, I am. And I was just getting ready to ask the next question, because this is active listening. See, you have to ask them three or four questions. You've got to do your best 
to act like you're paying attention. <laughs> and then you get to talk about yourself, because that's how people have conversation. That's, that's normal conversation. But this is what we do as alcoholic, right? Alcoholism shows up like this. I said, so you're a singer-songwriter? She goes, yes, I am. And one of our, our little, you know, um, eight-year sober pipes in and goes, my cousin worked for uh, uh, Gary Strait. Yeah, he was a singer-songwriter for Gary Strait. And then for the next ten minutes, we talked about his cousin. She never even got to say anything about the singer-songwriter that she did. And the whole time I'm standing there thinking, put a sock in it. Shut up. Because you see, that's what we do. The minute you say something, I think about how that affects me, how it reminds me of me, and my stuff is really more exciting than yours. And so I'm going to need to talk badly right now. So that level of self-centered, just, just be heightenedly aware about it. So it talks about this selfishness and self-centeredness, right? And, 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 and you know, I, I'm going to tell you something about how this, this producer of confusion rather than harmony. I love where it says that. It says, isn't it evident to all the rest of the players that these are the things she wants? Is she not really in her best moments a producer of confusion rather than harmony? Oh, my God. This was not what I wanted to have happen. My son, my daughter stole our grandkids and moved to Gig Harbor, Washington, God Almighty, couldn't be any farther to get there. And uh, so I, I get to go out there about every three months and stay. And so my son is kind of barking about that they want to go to Colorado Springs, he and his wife, and she's pregnant. And I, I'm telling Charlie, they're not going. They're not stealing one more grandbaby from me, okay? I'm living in Texas the rest of my life. I want these grandbabies closer to me. And so Charlie said, well, what are we going to do? I said, let's, let's help them buy a house. And he goes, Okay. And uh, that's the part I love about my husband. <laughs> and uh, he says, okay. And I said, he said, you know what, Katie, we can get a house for about $75,000. I'll put $10,000 down, give that to him as a gift. You know, my, they're living over in Cracktown next to a, uh, uh, a, a predator, a, a sex offender, because in Texas you've got to knock on the doors and tell everybody you are. And so uh, I want him out of there. And my little, my little daughter-in-law is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And so as it turns out, I go looking for these houses at 75000 And, you know, 75000 are kind of dumpy. And so, but at 85,000, they're kind of nice. And so I go to Charlie and I'm working the angle with him and he says, oh, fine, 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 fine. Well, long story short, by the time we're said and done, I have convinced the realtor who is a new realtor in AA to give me the key, the little electronic key, because he's not working fast enough for me. I put his job in jeopardy, but nobody will know. It's not hurting anybody. Just give me. So I take the key, and Charlie and I got access to every house in Austin, Texas. You know what I'm saying? I mean to tell you. And I had the big lie in case anybody walked in. My realtor's on the way. Blah, blah, blah. Get on the phone if I need to and say, oh, you can't, oh, you can't make it. You know, oh, yeah. Oh, trust me. 28 years sober. Proud of that? Oh, no. No. Uh, yeah. My life, yes. And so, so he says, all of a sudden then I realize I have worked and worked and worked on Charlie, and I have convinced him that a $125,000 house is way better, and let's put $20,000 down. Now, this whole time, I know I'm working an angle on my husband, okay? We know that. Welcome to marriage, okay? I know that. What I don't see happening is when my son comes over, they're young, they don't know any different. He comes over, all he sees is this spectacular house, and he and his wife are sitting there, the realtor is getting ready to come, and he looks at me and says, Mom, how much is that uh, mortgage going to be? I said, well, look, it shows you on the computer how to figure that out. And I looked at him and I said, Sam, it's going to be like $1,175. And he goes, Mom, I can't afford that. And he bursts into tears. His wife bursts into tears. He flies out of the room. And the whole thing is going in the ditch, man. <laughs> Are you with me? It never occurred to me that I was on a mission and driven and what was happening to my son. That because I wanted him in this house. And I, so you know what I do? I go out there. I said, Sam, I'll help you with the mortgage. Is that a big fat lie? Oh, my God. For like three months. And then I'm done because now I resent you. You know what I mean? And then he, says, then he says, Mom, you know, I'm trying to do this on my own. Blah, 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 blah. So I go back in. I look at Charlie. I go, Charlie, just stroke a check. Just stroke a check for the house. And Charlie goes, I am not going to stroke a check for the house. I'm like... Oh my God! 
And it is terrible. Oh, long story short, my son says, uh, Mom, the next day he says, Mom, we're really doing fine. We're kind of glad this whole deal's over. I took this amazing gift of my husband being willing to help them buy a home, and I ruined it. Producer of confusion rather than harmony. And it says, where'd my glasses go? I'm keeping an eye on the time, Lee. I know your butt's getting sore. Just hang in there, hang in there, hang in there. And so it says, <clears throat> we're, we're driven by a hundred forms of fear, self-delusion, self-seeking, and self-pity. We step on the toes of our fellows and they retaliate. Sometimes they hurt us, seeming without provocation. Listen to this line. But invariably we find that at some time in the past we made a decision based on self, which later placed me in a position to be hurt. I made a decision based on self and didn't even see it. See, so our troubles, we think, are basically of our own making. If I want freedom, the problem's got to be me. They arise out of ourselves, and the alcoholic is an extreme example of self-will run riot. See, guys, life is not coming at me. It's coming from me. I think it's coming at me. Above everything, we alcoholics must be rid of this selfishness. We must or it kills us. Whoo, God makes that possible. There often seems no way of entirely getting rid of self without his aid. Many of us had moral and philosophical convictions galore, but we couldn't live up to them no matter how hard we tried. See, that's why if you throw out a, a slogan at me, acceptance is the key, love and tolerance is our code. That's a promise, guys. You don't get that benefit until you've worked the steps. So what you're basically saying to me is work the promises and hope the steps come true. You see, that's why when, when I'm really hurting and somebody lobs out some sort of lame promise, you know what I mean? It's a fabulous promise, but it's lame when you're coming at me. And it says, neither could we reduce our self-centeredness much by wishing or trying on our own. I can't work on my character defects. It tells me right there, it's like whack-a-mole. You know what I mean? That's where somebody goes, you know, by golly, I need to be less selfish. That's what the problem is. I cannot fix self with self. And this is the very end of it. And uh, it says, um, the part where it says, we just finished, what do we mean, now what do we do? It says we have to have God's help. And I love that Gary touched on this last night. This is talking about the terms. God does not make too hard a terms for those who seek him. Seek. Right? Continue to look. I've always been a seeker. Kim talked about it. Always been a seeker. Down deep in my heart, I knew there was something more. I just didn't know. I kept thinking I needed God to love me. God loves me drunk, and he loves me sober. God loves me. Me is the problem. And it says that uh, um, this is the how and why of it. First of all, we had to quit playing God. You can get an alcoholic to quit drinking faster and easier than you can get them to quit playing God. I'm telling you what. And uh, uh, it didn't work. These are all management decisions. Next we decide here. Uh, next we decide here's the decision. The prayer is the reiteration. This is the decision. That hereafter in this drama of life, God was going to be our director. He's the principal, we're his agents. We, an agent means to be empowered to act on his behalf. You know, I love what Gary said last night. He, he, did you feel like he was empowered? At one point, didn't he look like a politician with this thing here? And every, <laughs> I am voting for you, mister. And it says... Um, uh, it says, when we sincerely took up this position, what position that we're going to quit playing God, all sorts of remarkable things followed. We had a new employer. Being all-powerful, he provides what we need if we keep close to him and perform his work well. Keep close to him and perform his work well. Shut up. So you don't need me in there being Mrs. God? <laughs> or, or Sister Teresa? Huh? But come on. Surely he needs my help. And, and, you know, so it's not my job to figure out who can stay sober and who can't. It's not my job to run the world. I've got to stay close to him. How do I stay close to him? I've got to get close to him. I've got to get unblocked, four through nine. I've got to live in the disciplines of ten and eleven. I have to help his children. Stay close to him. Perform his work well. Help his children. You want to go out there and do breast uh, cancer foundation stuff? You want to feed the uh, hungry in the soup kitchen? Have at it. That is not my primary purpose. My primary purpose, because I can help when no one else can, is to help the drunk. Yes? Say yes. And uh, 
there's a thing I got to read on pride because it seemed to get some people really aroused, and then I'll I'll wrap it up because I I'm done. Um, well, I'm really not, but I'm got to say that. Um, <laughs> It says, uh, listen to this, because it's really cool, and I want it on a CD. My name is Pride. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because when I'm dead, I want all of y'all at my funeral, and everybody gets to say one nice thing about me, okay? <laughs> That's the deal. It says, uh, my name is Pride. I am a cheater. I cheat you out of your God-given destiny because you demand your own way. I cheat you out of contentment because you deserve better than this. I cheat you out of knowledge because you already know it all. I cheat you out of holiness because you refuse to admit you're wrong. I cheat you out of genuine friendship because nobody's going to know the real you. I cheat you out of love because your real romance demands sacrifice. My name is Pride. I am a cheater. You may think I'm always looking out for you. I'm looking to make a fool of you. If you're not in the book, get in the book. And if you are, I'll see you on the firing lines. Thank you very much.